Na tingonya ya mangabiti baba. Okay, no, this isn't the Lion King live action remake. But these energetic ants carrying pieces of cut up leaves in a parade like procession are probably every ant keeper's dream. Keeping them as pets, I mean. To be honest, they're definitely one of mine. They're called leaf cutter ants. And for years, I have dreamed of keeping them. Here's why. It's not only their cool behavior of carrying these pieces of cut up leaves back to their nest, but the coolest part is actually why they are. You see, the ants are doing this because... Fungus. Lush balls of fungus. So in case you're new to the world of ants, these leafcutter ants are ancient farmers. And for 50 million years, they have been farming massive combs of fungus within their nests. And it's the fungus, not the leaves, that the ants actually eat. You see, the ants chew up these leaf pieces brought back to the nest and use the leaf mash to fertilize gardens of this special ant fungus, a fungus species found nowhere else in nature but within the nests of these leafcutter ants. The ant fungus has a symbiotic relationship with these leafcutters, and every ant keeper in the world drools at the thought of owning one. Watching the ants farm their epic fungus combs in their nest chambers in such a unique and complex circle of life. So what's the deal? Why don't I own a leafcutter ant colony yet, you ask? Well, hear me out. It's all ethics. Here on the channel, I've always been part of the school of thought that as an ant keeper, the responsible thing to do is to only keep ants caught in my backyard. Because keeping ants imported from another country can have some very serious and devastating ecological effects to the circle of life in my country, if the ants ever got out. And well, as awesome as these leafcutter ants are, they aren't native to where I live, sadly. Boo! They're from Central and South America. P.S. not Africa. So yes, Lion King got it wrong. So inside, I knew the only way I'd ever be able to own my dream fungus farming leafcutter ant colony was if I moved to South America, which I wasn't going to do. But then something truly magical happened, guys. Several months ago, a huge nuptial flight of not ants, but termites was taking place one night at a cottage I was staying at. An annual event where virgin termite kings and queens take to the air to pair up and get quote unquote married for life. Once the termites find their one true life love, they embark on a journey together to find a place underground to start growing their massive colonies. I decided to catch several of these termite wedded pairs and place them in test tubes, which is what we ant keepers do to incubate new queen ants. And to my surprise, the termite royals in their test tubes went on to lay eggs, which hatched into some cute workers and eventually even some scary looking soldiers with big heads. Now I initially thought, hey, feeding these termite colonies would be easy. Just give them some dead rotting wood and they'll be good, right? But guys, this is where the story gets insane. Turns out after speaking with a termite expert and hobbyist who goes by the screen name Cicada Fun, I was surprised to learn that these termites weren't the rotting wood eating pesty type of termites that everyone hates. No, the termites I had caught were actually the well-known species Macrotermes gilvis, a species of termite that get this, eats fungus, a special type of termite fungus fertilized with digestive leaves that the termites take back to their nest. A fungus farmed by the termites within their nests. OMG, can you imagine my joy after all these years of lamenting over not being able to have leafcutter ant colonies as pets due to my ant keeping ethics? All along, there were termites, totally native to my country, doing the exact same thing right below my feet without me knowing. How awesome. I could get with fungus growing termites cool. But hold up, here's where it got complicated. Upon further research, turns out getting the termite colonies to farm their fungus was a bit more complex than in leafcutter ants. You see, in leafcutter ants, the starting queen has fungus spores taken from her birth nest, which she uses to seed the ant fungus gardens for her and her future colony. But in Macrotermes gilvis termites, it didn't quite work the same way. The process of starting their fungus garden was a bit more tricky. The termites needed the proper materials first, 
Once the starting termite colonies reach a certain size, they break out of their birth chamber and forage for pieces of dead leaves and detritus, which contain the termite fungus spores on them, needed to seed their fungus gardens. These termite fungus spores are dispersed all over an area via wind from mushrooms that sprout from other Macrotermes gilvis nests. Now I know these mushrooms and later realized that I've actually eaten them because in my country, there is a certain season when people go out and hunt for these highly prized and delicious mushrooms known as termitomyces or termite mushrooms from termite mounds. After a night of thunder and lightning, they are literally hand-picked from the termite mounds, washed and cooked. Super yummy. Anyway, so these termitomyces mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of the termite fungus my Macrotermes gilvis termites eat. So I went out back to the area I caught the termites and grabbed handfuls of rotting leaves and twigs from different spots, hoping the termitomyces spores were all over them. My plan was to give the young termite colonies I was keeping the detritus whenever they were ready to forage so they could start their own fungus gardens for nourishment. Now another thing my termite friend Cicada Fun pointed out was that the test tubes were not the best setup for the termite colonies. Seeing as the termites had natural problems walking on such a smooth rounded surface, often ending up on their backs, and he said that some workers were probably dying from the struggle. Losing termite workers at this early stage was bad because the royals were feeding each worker a self-made nutritious soup made from liquefied body tissues. And well, this soup was not unlimited and was only enough to raise a certain number of workers large enough to safely forage outside for the spore-ridden detritus. Until then, the royals would get skinnier and skinnier until they had nothing left. But hopefully before then, the workers will have started to farm their fungus comb, which is the hardest part. So after discussing some possible termite housing options, I decided it was time to move my young termite colonies into more suitable homes. Homes that would better support the growing of their fungus combs. And one of the things I learned was that these new homes needed to provide the termites the proper soil type to do that. According to Cicada Fun, the termites needed soils that were a bit more clay heavy and lower in organic material. So to reduce rogue molds from endangering the colony and their fungus combs, once they were up and growing. So this week, I went to my backyard, which I knew had soils that were clay heavy, if I dug deep enough, to try and collect these ideal soils for my termites. And guys, this is where the most incredible and crazy thing happened. After locating a random bare patch of soil in my yard, I began to dig. And what I found just three inches below the surface was the Holy Grail. This was no bare patch of soil. This was a termite nest, a Macrotermes gilvis termite nest in my yard. And what I was looking at in that chamber of clay soil was a huge comb of termite fungus. What? And so I see family, this was where the most epic story began. Welcome to the Ants Canada Ant Channel Termite Edition. subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon. Welcome to the AC family. Enjoy. So according to Cicada Fun, collecting some termite fungus comb wouldn't harm the colony in my yard because there was a lot of it in the nest. I was still mind blown that I had a Macrotermes gilvis nest in my yard and I was determined to keep them alive in case I needed some fungus comb for my own termite colonies in the future. And spoiler alert, I did end up giving some of my termites some fungus comb to see if they would actually adopt it, eat from it, and or start farming it. But AC family, what my termites did with my termite fungus comb offerings will truly blow you away. Stay tuned for that coming up. But guys, before all that, let's take a closer look at this super cool termite fungus comb I took back home, shall we? Incredible! It's one thing to learn about the termite fungus from literature and termite talk, but seeing it right before my eyes was such a trip. The entire comb structure was actually quite beautiful. Have a look. Ooh. 
So you see those white buds that are sprouting here and there from the comb? Those are apparently the termite fungus, which is eaten by the termites. The comb itself is a mixture of digested leaf litter and detritus that the termites forage for and poop out, forming this amazing comb. It looked like and had the consistency of soft graham crackers. I guess this comb shape seems to be the most conducive design for the fungus to thrive. It even looks somewhat similar to the leaf cutter ants fungus comb, don't you think? Amazing to think that despite ants and termites not being even closely related insects, taxonomically speaking, they both evolved to create similar structures from eating similar food. It was an example of convergent evolution at its finest. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the fuzz you see on the comb actually is. It could be part of the termite fungus as well, or perhaps a weed parasitic fungus that the termites keep under control somehow. Not sure, but more about that later. I planned on returning this fungus comb back where I found it, into the termite nest in my yard, once I was done with it. But first, I want to show you what I had planned for this fungus comb and my termites. It was time for us to have some fun, guys. AC family, what you're seeing here is five different setups, each containing a young termite colony from my collection. I've moved my termite colonies into them. Let's name the colonies A, B, C, D, and E. Each setup is slightly different and each contains the ideal clay soil I collected from around the termite nest in my yard. I will show you each setup and how I use them to test via trial and error what the best setup was for my Macrotermes gilvis colonies, as well as what happened when I gave some termite fungus comb to some of my termites. The aim was to have at least one of these termite colonies succeed at getting to the stage where they were growing their own fungus combs in their setups, like they would in the wild. It was key to successfully rearing the termite colonies to maturity, but I had no clue how epic this whole termite fungus experiment was about to be. Day 1 Colony A So it was advised to me to take my best colonies and simply bury them in the clay soil. Though visibility of the termite colony would be poor, at least the termites would have a much better chance at making it, seeing as the conditions were closest to what they would have in nature. So the setup of colony A was simply a container with the test tube containing the termites buried three inches below the soil. I left a bit of space so the termites could wander out if they wanted to, and we could catch a glimpse of them. And what was cool was, the termites did exactly what I had hoped. The termite workers had begun to wander and burrow out of their test tube and explore the extensive network of tight corridors that existed in their setup. Colony A was my most successful colony, with a large number of workers and even soldiers. I loved watching them explore. Could they be foraging for leaf litter now? I did notice that some of the workers had ingested some soil, as you could clearly see it through their semi-transparent bodies. This is apparently typical termite behavior, as they will regurgitate the soil mixed with sticky body fluids later to help create walls and barriers. Super cool to see them so in their element. I wondered if they had already ingested some bits of detritus from the soil around them. I mean, I inevitably scooped up a few root tips and organic matter while digging for the ideal clay soil. I wondered if they ingested some termite spore-ridden material and were already forming their fungus comb. Only time would tell. But regardless, I had more to help support any termite fungus comb building happening in this container. It was time to bring out the leaf litter. I placed in the detritus. I tried to choose different types of detritus. Leaves, grasses, decaying wood, seeing as I had no idea which type the termites would favor, nor which type had the termite spores they needed to start their comb. And then it was done. Looking underground, it did seem like the foraging termites seemed excited. I wondered if somehow they could smell the detritus up at ground level. Look at it. Doesn't it seem a bit heightened in excitement level? I watched it run to one end of the container, then back to the colony. I had high hopes for this colony A, and so far things were looking hopeful. Or at least, it seemed. 
Moving on to Colony B. This setup was kind of like Colony A setup, with the test tube colony buried mostly below a layer of soil. Only I created a spacious chamber so that I could film and see the colony a lot more. Looking into the test tube, I could see the young colony inside. But to my surprise, I only saw one of the termite royals. That's odd. After looking around, I noticed the other termite royal, not sure if it was the king or queen, was outside the test tube. Was it snooping around? It was odd to see. The royals usually don't split up like this. Anyway, perhaps it was the royals' way of saying to the rest of the colony, Hey guys, come out here! This is so much more space, and it's awesome out here. Other than the royal who stepped outside the test tube, I didn't see any workers foraging outside, so I chose not to add detritus for now. Instead, I would allow this colony more time to settle in. Colony C is an interesting setup. Here's where the setups get a little more risque, so to speak. I decided to create an experimental setup where I created a layer of semi-absorbent concrete and above it, a layer of clay soil, making the entire setup sort of a large founding chamber. I had to dump the colony out of their test tube, which was a bit scary to do, but was much easier than I thought, as most of the colony could not grip onto the glass, eggs included. The setup also had an exit, which I plugged up with cotton for now. This was the colony right after putting them in. They were scattered all around, and a bit dazed. There was a worker and an egg stranded a bit far away, and I hoped the colony would come rescue them. One thing I did find strange was this worker here. See the tip of its abdomen? Doesn't it look like it's laying an egg? Strangely, I thought the termite was injured, but then I caught workers periodically pulling at it. I asked Cicada Fun if workers could lay eggs, and he said to the best of his knowledge, no. I know in the world of ants, the workers of some species can lay eggs, but they're trophic, meaning they don't hatch into anything, or they become male ants. But does this happen in termites too? Odd. Anyway, several hours later, the colony was all grouped together, organized, and nestled like they were in their test tube. What I loved about this setup of the colony was that visibility was 100% awesome. I could clearly see the colony and could also see that some of the workers were wandering the setup. I wondered if perhaps they were foraging. AC family, that's when I decided to go for it. If these wandering workers were in foraging mode for spore-ridden detritus, wanting to start building their fungus comb, I had exactly what they needed. My plan was to place some detritus somewhere up here, far from the colony. So I went straight to work. I needed to place in smaller pieces of detritus, so I could keep the pile away from the colony. So with scissors, I cut up pieces of detritus to place inside the setup. Done! When it was all in, I caught a royal checking out the pile. Oh, I sure hope the termites could use it to start building a comb. But then another idea came to me. Sometimes ant keepers keeping leafcutter ants offer some ant fungus comb from another established colony to starting colonies to help boost their chances of founding a thriving fungus garden. I began to wonder if I could also try this with my termites. According to studies of Macrotermes gilvis, when scientists tried giving starting colonies a fungus comb from another colony, only 10% successfully went on to create a thriving fungus comb and colony. The odds were a bit low, but I figured, hey, if the fungus comb I collected from the Macrotermes gilvis colony in my yard was rejected by these termites, I could just remove it from the setup before it molds up or something. So guys, the scientist in me wanted to experiment, so I went for it. I gave Colony C a small bit of termite fungus comb. Now for sure this colony had all it needed to get started building their comb. It was a long shot, but what the termites ended up doing with all this was admittedly surprising. But let's move on now to Colony D. This colony was in a similar setup, only without the hydrating concrete layer. So this colony was quite interesting. Unlike any of the other colonies before, this colony grouped together pretty quick and went straight to work. The workers began building a chamber within the setup. See the mud wall they're working on? 
It was totally fascinating to watch the termites build it. The royals, eggs, and workers were all grouped up in the middle, awaiting to be completely enclosed under their dome of mud. I actually quite loved this and was happy the colony was so proactive. Having the colony live in a chamber within the setup made me feel more at ease because the colony could better control things like humidity, especially whenever I would open the setup. No workers looked like they were foraging, which to me meant they probably weren't ready for the foraging and fungus building stage yet. But I couldn't wait to see the construction of the chamber when it was all done. Now finally moving on to Colony E. Now this setup looks a bit weird, but let me explain. My hopes was the colony would move out of their test tube and onto this soil clay island, and I could then proceed to remove the test tube and turn the entire setup the right way up. But the colony didn't end up doing that. Instead, they ended up sealing the end of their test tube with the soil clay, which I guess was okay for now. Now with this colony, the workers didn't seem like they were in the mood to forage. So I didn't offer detritus, but I decided since I still had access to the colony's living space and I could see them, why not try providing this colony some fungus comb too? Which is what I did. At first I thought one of the royals was going to eat from it, or at least that's what I thought. Nope, scratch that. It looked like the termites were ignoring the fungus comb piece. Man, if I were these termites and I hadn't had a real meal other than liquefied body tissues from the royals my whole life, I'd be devouring this fungus. I don't know about you. When the seal was complete, the colony was all relaxed inside their test tube, along with the chunk of fungus comb. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention was that I also placed a carpet of clay soil into the test tube so that the colony could get a better grip. The termites seemed to appreciate that. There were some fungus comb crumbs that I unintentionally spilled outside of the test tube. I was going to clean it up and remove these pieces, but I decided to leave them for now, in case the termites might decide they wanted to break out and gather them later. I'm pretty glad I did that, because later it would be giving me a very key piece of information about this colony and how the fungus comb works. Soon I spotted some baby termites checking out the fungus comb. Could they be eating from it? Only time would tell. But eventually, if this colony did end up eating the fungus growing on this comb, the comb would eventually run out and the termites would need to break out of their test tube to forage for detritus. And once that happened, I would be ready for them with detritus pieces. And they wouldn't even need to be detritus with spores, seeing as they already had this starting fungus comb. I was excited to see what was up next. Day 2. Colony A. I checked below and noticed there was still lots of foraging going on. Could it be that over the past 24 hours, the workers had surfaced and taken a few bites of our detritus? The termites did seem like they had all sorts of different colors in them, like browns. See it? Browns that match the colors of some of our leaves. Oh, I could feel it! This colony was well on the road to building their fungus comb. Again? So I thought. Colony B was strangely the same. One of the royals was inside with the rest of the colony, while the other royal was outside, not joining the colony. How odd. I began to worry for this colony, but resolved not to interfere with them just yet. The truth about this colony would soon reveal itself. It wasn't at all what I expected. I'm sure some of you guys might have noticed something strange about this colony too. I'll reveal what later. Colony C was a bit of a surprise. Looking into the setup, I noticed that the fungus comb seemed untouched and not of interest to the colony. The detritus also seemed untouched, judging from the bodies of the workers. I didn't see any new colors in their bodies. Hmm. I thought the termites might have at least eaten the white bud off the comb. But nope. It was still there, untouched. Strange. I decided to try waiting another day to see if the termites would change their mind. Colony D was almost done constructing their mud dome. Yay! Love this colony. I trust that they would make this chamber the perfect size for their colony and would expand as needed. And once they were ready to forage, I would see them breaking out and foraging and would be ready to give them their detritus 
and possibly starting fungus comb. Now, AC family, here's where things got very interesting. Colony E in their weird experimental setup. Now, is it just me, or does it look like the termites are actually tending to this piece of fungus comb? Right? I watched as the workers inspected the fungus comb, in my mind much like a farmer would his garden of growing veggies. If it was true, man, this would be a total win. This colony was quickly becoming my favorite. And guys, the next day, things started to get crazy. Day 3. Peeking into the setup of Colony A, which up till now held so much promise, revealed a very shocking discovery. <gasps> Dead workers! Four of them! What? No! How did this happen? The colony was doing so well! I looked into the test tube, hoping with all my might to see movement. And yes, thank goodness, it looked like the colony was still alive and moving in there. I mentioned this grim discovery to Sakata Fun, and he too was pretty perplexed. It could have been a bunch of things. For instance, the detritus could have contained contaminants like pesticides or harmful chemicals. After all, some of the detritus was collected at roadsides and some close to private property. And in my country, they do release pesticides on lawns to specifically kill termites and the inconspicuous mounds they create, which I find a terrible thing to do. Another thing that could have caused the deaths, according to Sakata Fun, was poor ventilation in the soil, as I could have packed the clay soil too tightly, leading to less water evaporating from it and the entire setup getting too hot. Whatever it was, I was sad. But one thing was for sure, I needed to remove the colony from this setup ASAP in order to not lose any more workers, and God forbid, the royals. This was after all my biggest and most successful colony. I carefully removed the detritus and dug the test tube out. I had plans to place them into a new setup, but AC family, little did I know, in doing so, I would soon find out the answers to my questions as to why the four workers might have died. A shocking discovery was coming up my way shortly. But first, another tragedy. Looking into Colony B again, I found it strange that the Royal was still outside the test tube and the other inside. But guys, after looking much more closely, do you guys see it? Did you guys notice that the termite royal inside the test tube was laying in the same position as it had been since day one? As I began to stare, the truth began to set in. No, the royal was dead. This brought me so much sadness. More termite death. But these two setups were supposed to be the safest and closest to nature I could give them. I also had no idea whether the queen or king, not sure which one it was, had died prior to me putting the test tube in, or the next day after. This was another very tragic mystery to me. I resolved to simply bury this colony into the ground outside in my yard, seeing as there was no hope for it to survive without both royals alive now. Mature termite colonies can reinvent backup kings and queens in case one of them dies, however not starting termite colonies like this one. Goodbye, Colony B. I tried my best for you. Enjoy your remaining time in the soil outside, in my yard. AC family, that was two colonies with not good news. What was up with Colony C? I peeked into their setup and was also shocked at what I saw. I immediately noticed the fungus comb piece was gone. Where was it? Had they eaten it? Nope, it was over there. I could see it ripped into pieces and used to block the entrance hole to their setup. Okay, well, maybe they ate the fungus bud at least? I had no idea, but now I was concerned about the detritus. If it indeed was what killed the four termites of Colony A, perhaps it was a danger to this colony. Luckily, judging from the colors of the workers' bodies, it didn't seem like the termites had munched on the detritus yet. This was good, but I needed to remove the detritus now just to be on the safe side. I figured if ever this colony were to need detritus, I would just try to collect it from my yard, where I know I don't spray pesticides, and where I know Macrotermes termites have started growing their fungus combs. 
I could try to offer them detritus again, maybe a few days from now. Colony D had now completed their mud dome. I was certain this colony had a great chance at surviving and thriving simply because they were in control of their living space now within that dome. And all I needed to do was water the setup if ever things looked too dry. I hoped and prayed I would one day see workers foraging outside of the dome so I could try giving them some detritus from my yard and fungus comb perhaps. And now we see family, perhaps the biggest of plot twists and revelations came when checking on Colony E. By the third day, lots of workers were now crawling all over the fungus comb. And I swear it looked like they were tending it. Don't you guys think so? And now check this out. Remember the other stray pieces of fungus comb outside their test tube? Well, they had now gone moldy. I had to remove them to keep the mold outbreak from spreading. But guys, what I found the most interesting about all of this was that despite these other fungus comb pieces growing moldy, the fungus comb inside the test tube was not molding. This to me was evidence that the termites must be tending to this piece of fungus comb. You see, leaf cutter ants also have to deal with killer parasitic molds or fungus, kind of like weeds, that attack their fungus combs. And to do that, they produce an antifungal substance produced by symbiotic bacteria on their bodies aimed to specifically kill these unwanted fungus weeds. This special bacterially produced antifungal helps keep the leafcutter ants' fungal combs pristine. And I bet my bottom dollar these termites have evolved something similar. Because look at how unattacked by mold this fungus comb is inside their nest. It actually looks as pristine as it did when I first put it in. And that's not all. I looked closer from another angle and it looked like another white bud was growing in. Yay! More food for the termites. My intuition said that these termites had a good chance of keeping this fungus comb alive and they were now eating from it. If so, when the time came that this comb would need more fertilizer for the fungus buds, i.e. detritus, I was sure the termites would be foraging out onto this mud platform and I could then give them some detritus from my yard to continue growing the fungus comb bigger and bigger until they started growing it outside their test tube. Let's keep our fingers crossed, AC family, and hope they succeed. Now back to Colony A for a moment. I placed them in a setup like this. Just a clay soil bottom and attached via an AC test tube portal. The colony had at least lined their test tube with soil bits from their last setup, so they could navigate much more comfortably around their test tube. I figured they would move out if they wanted to, but I needed to monitor them closely to figure out what was going on with the sudden worker deaths when in their previous setup. As I looked into the test tube, something was just not right. Guys, let me know if you see it too. Oh no, not this. It wasn't long before I discovered something truly grim with Colony A. Mites covering the bodies of many of the workers no way! Termites have to deal with parasitic mites too? This must have been the reason why the four termites died. I haven't the slightest clue as to how this colony contracted mites. Perhaps parasitic mites were hitching a ride on the detritus and that's how they found their way to the termite colony? It didn't seem like there were mites on the royals yet, but whatever the case, I made sure to place this termite colony setup far away from the others and also monitor the termite workers of Colony C, who were also exposed to the same batch of detritus I gave to Colony A. So far, Colony C seemed mite-free. And so, AC family, that was it. I had learned so much about these five termite setups over the past three days. Some had ended in tragedy, others ended in pleasant surprises, while others still brought me great hope. The fact that we saw one of our termite colonies tending to their small fungus garden brought me so much joy. I found this whole experiment and challenge of starting up one of these Macrotermes gilvis colonies and getting them to successfully grow a fungus comb was an important one. Because there's still a lot we humans don't actually know about how these termites do it in the wild. Because remember how I mentioned that in my country, people go hunting for these termite mushrooms called Termitomyces mushrooms? 
after a lightning storm? Well, somehow, lightning seems to be tied into the entire life cycle of the termite fungus, something we still don't completely understand. And plus, the termites appear to have a secret sauce, so to speak, which allows them to cultivate these termite fungus combs and resulting mushrooms. Another thing scientists still don't understand, there must be a unique set of symbiotic microbes and enzymes that exist within the termite's gut that helps this termitomyces fungus grow from their combs of pooped out detritus. Macrotermes gilvus termites have been hiding their mushroom growing secrets like a holy grail for millions of years. In fact, there has not been one single instance of successful lab cultivation of termitomyces mushrooms. Though we humans have definitely tried because termitomyces mushrooms are tasty. I can attest to this. And I think farmers have identified that they would definitely make a great agricultural product for mass human consumption. If we could somehow grow the mushrooms artificially in indoor mushroom farms. But we still can't. And to this day, in different countries where these termite mushrooms exist, if you want those tasty termite mushrooms, you need to collect them from termite mounds and usually after a lightning storm. But if we happen to get lucky and are one day successful at growing one of these Macrotermes gilvis termite colonies into massive colonies within a setup, all growing these amazing fungus combs to the point where the termites create a mound within their setup, could you imagine if we wake up one day after a lightning storm and spot tasty mushrooms growing from our termite nests? I think I'd freak out. That would be a scientific breakthrough, and we EC family would have been the first in the world to do it. Not to mention the best mushroom soup ever. Anyway, I'll be sure to keep you all updated on the progress of these remaining termite colonies. But do remember to kindly subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so you don't miss an episode and be part of this ongoing termite story. Also be sure to hit the like button to let YouTube know that these videos are worth sharing to new audiences. And share this video with your nature loving friends. I think the world needs to know more about how termites, soils, weather and fungus are connected. Don't you? And boo to termite pesticides. Let them mounds rise. I know I won't be touching mine around my home. Thank you all for watching and supporting the ants and termites and fungus. It's ant, termite, fungus, lightning, soil, planet earth, circle of life, love forever. Not in